questions. My name is Conrad Fitzhugh. I'm a senior reporter at The Real Deal. And this is the 9 a.m. panel titled 21st Century CRE, how big data consolidation IPOs are shaping the industry. Um, it's a very broad topic. And if you just sort of take stock and look at what's happened over the last year in the commercial brokerage business, we've had huge IPOs, Cushman and Wakefield going public, Newmark going public. We've had a lot of big mergers, like Compass buying Pacific Union. I could list a dozen others. Um, you have technology changing the way people work. You have companies fighting for talent. Um, Jeff was just mentioning a feeding frenzy among brokers, which is quite the term. So if you take all that into account, it just seems like the brokerage industry is a lot different now than it was a year ago. So it's an exciting time, and I'm glad we have a panel with some of the people who are at the forefront of these changes. We'll um, talk a bit about all these topics and try to trace how the business is changing, how brokers are adapting to this uh, changing times. And I'll very briefly introduce each, each panelist, then we'll go straight to the discussion. We'll have about 40 minutes. And at the end, hopefully, you, you guys all have questions. If not, we'll just keep rambling. So it's your call. Um, all right, so to my left, I have Ralph McLaughlin. Uh, most, some of you may know him from his past gig as chief economist of Trulia. He now runs his own company called Veritas Urbis Economics, which is a consultancy that helps developers, home builders, and local governments make sense of the markets. To his left, we have Jeff Rinkoff, who's the CEO of Lee and Associates. He's been at the company since 1997 and became CEO in 2014. So you guys are all familiar with Lee and Associates, but, um, just uh, to remind you guys, the company had about $13 billion in transactions last year across the country, has 1,000 brokers, and in recent news, the company expanded to Miami and launched a New York investment sales division. Um, to his left, we have Patrick McGrosky, who so happens to be in charge of this building. He is a managing director at CBRE, char in charge of leasing, property, and project management for 4.5 million square feet of Class A office properties which is primarily this complex that we're in, and then Walter Garden. Um, and uh, to his left, we have Elizabeth Clark, who uh, I want to say at Pacific Union, but I was just told as of November 1st, Compass. <laughs> so she is uh, currently still a senior vice president at Pacific Union. She represents both buyers and sellers of commercial real estate, sort of a focus on the five to $20 million range. And um, she began her career at Marcus and Millichap and joined Pacific Union in this very eventful year, 2018. So Elizabeth, let's start with you then. Yeah, um, so since one of the topics of this discussion is consolidation, one of the biggest deals of the year was Compass buying Pacific Union. So you joined Pacific Union in 2018, and then Compass just buys this company. Were you expecting this when you joined them, or was it just a complete surprise to no, you? No, absolutely not. I mean, we had come over from BRC to Pacific Union um, in April, and we had made kind of a um, unconventional move in going to more of a residential firm as opposed to going to one of the big investment firms. And uh, we liked it. We were very happy. We had a group, and then out of nowhere, um, we found out kind of through text messages coming through one day that we had been purchased because it had been leaked in um, the media. And so I think everyone can understand that uh, brokers do have a flair for the dramatic. So everyone was very kind of upset and concerned. Um, but I think as we've settled in, we only look at it as something that can benefit us. And uh, Compass has had a strong you know, forefront in technology. So I think we're looking at it saying, well, we use kind of a brick and mortar approach to the business, and how can Compass help us expand our business? Mm -hmm. Jeff, Patrick, so Compass is known primarily as a residential company, right? Now it's expanding in New York pretty aggressively. Um, you know, Elizabeth is a commercial broker. The company clearly has ambitions in the commercial space. With this deal, do you have to see Compass as a competitor in the commercial space now, or are they still sort of a long way off? So I think we have to be fair and, and recognize them as a competitor. They have strong brokerage talent, and you know where where Elizabeth started at BRC, we certainly recognize them historically as a competitor. So the brokerage talent evolves, moves on, and, and I think gets consolidated to your earlier point. So we absolutely recognize them as a competitor. Mm -hmm. so let's take a step back. Right, it's I pulled this number from one of our recent articles. It's not just Compass buying Pacific Union. The previous record year for 
M&A activity among real estate companies was 2007. Last year, total M&A activity was 25% above the 2007 record. And the total volume was $524.7 billion worth of real estate company mergers, which just sounds like a huge number. Um, so Compass is just one of many. Can we take a step back and what's happening in the market now? Why are we now seeing um, all this M&A activity? Is that, is that something you have an opinion on? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a good question. question. I, I think the two things, things that we have to think about, about here are, one, what would be sort of a, a cyclical trend that we see and what would be structural? And what do I mean by that is that if you look back over the last 100 years of uh, expansionary cycles, usually at the end of a cycle, if you don't know, you, you see a, a big uptick in, in mergers and acquisitions. Um, I think the question to ask ourselves now is, is, is this cyclical or is it structural? And I think um, at face value, you might get nervous and say this is cyclical and so we may be ready for a, a downturn here. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think we're in an era of rapidly transforming technology, data, and, and even talent that, that can make use of technology and data. And so I think there's also a flip side argument that, well, maybe this is more structural. Maybe this is just a changing landscape that we're going to enter a new uh, normal where there's a lot more uh, agglomeration of, of brokerages or just companies in, in general. So uh, I can't answer that uh, question full stop right now, but I think there is certainly an argument for the, for the latter over the former. So we have the cyclical argument where at the end of the cycle, the structural, um, the brokerage business is changing and it makes sense for companies to get bigger. Um, Jeff, what do you think? What's happening here? So I think you're in an environment where capital of all types is chasing, you know, is chasing transactional volume. And so maybe 25% in excess of 2007 volume seems like a big number, but I think inflation adjusting, it's probably about the same. But I also think the dynamics in this market in 2018 and beyond are substantially better. I mean, we don't have um, irresponsible lending. We have growing lease rates. We have tenants with stronger balance sheets. I don't think the market is over leveraged in, in any way, really. I mean, the, the lending's been responsible. I don't think we're overbuilt in, in high identity markets like you know, just for industrial distribution in the South Bay or in the Inland Empire. We have millions of square feet coming online and it's getting absorbed either prior to the construction completion or just after. Mm -hmm. So I don't think from a cyclical standpoint, it seems like there's quite a bit of runway to go. Um, from a structural standpoint, it seems like there is definitely a sea change. And so you've got capital that will pay a higher multiple for brokerage talent. I think that's given rise to a couple of the IPOs, some of the acquisition that you've seen. It certainly is um, a catalyst for us to expand as a company into markets where we don't have a presence, but that are large top 50 MSAs in the country because there is so much transaction volume and we have so many multi-market companies that want our services in places where we historically haven't had the ability, we just haven't had a flag. Mm -hmm. So you feel that pressure to expand as all these companies get bigger? I think it's pressure that is driven by the opportunity. So I don't think we're pressured to expand. We're really, really selective. So we're different than some of the public companies that um, that are expanding through acquisition. And our model is that we, we do not have the ability to become a public company. It's part, not part of our model. Our capital structure is very, very different. And it includes a co-investment of our existing senior brokers and every part of our expansion, which is probably more complicated than this conversation needs to be, but um, we, we, are, we will not become a public company. We really grow with entrepreneurial brokers that have had penetration and success in the market and want to have a different experience than what the strong public company experience is, um, but a little more entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Patrick, I mean, the real estate brokerage business has always been a little bit unique in the sense that you can be a fairly small company and be very successful, make a lot of money. There's a lot of industries out there where that hasn't been the case for like 50 years. Think of grocery stores or whatever have you. Do you think that's changing? Are we at the beginning of this big consolidation where eventually it'll lead to just a two, or th two or three or four or five CBRE type companies and no one else? I agree with what they were talking about. I think the runway is still a little bit longer here, and there's a ton of capital out uh, in the market right now. I think a lot of these smaller firms are looking at it saying, hey, why not? Let's take some, some chips off the table here, and if we can be acquired and make a lot of money and put some money in our pockets, we're going to do that. And, you know, if you look at the way that the industry is right now, very different from when I started. You know, I could go out and I could cold call and I could, you know, dial 15 people and get four or five 
um, uh, meetings. It doesn't happen anymore. It's all institutional. It's, it's the big corporations and they've got the corporate accounts. So I think the dynamics of the business have changed a lot. I think you're gonna see the bigger companies getting bigger and the smaller companies being uh, absorbed by the larger firms. Yeah, and Elizabeth, you're part of a bigger company now than you were a couple of months ago. Does it change anything for you? Is it, does it help to be, have this network behind you? You know, I think at the end of the day, it doesn't make that big of a difference. And it's funny that you mentioned kind of the cold calling approach because, you know, there are the people that are going to sell the institutional assets like the one we're sitting in, but the bread and butter of our business is really going after that five to $20 million range. And we still take an old school approach of cold calling and meeting. And so it's a little bit different where I think it's not going to affect us because that's our business model, and we execute on it, and we use uh, you know, the new technology or things to complement the business, but at the end of the day, we're still hitting the streets and hitting the grounds hard. And the funny thing is, we'll call or cold call institutional owners, and they'll still be responsive to us. So it's not limiting us in terms of our business. And you know, when we made the decision to go to Pacific Union, I asked one of my clients, because we were talking to a lot of the big firms, I asked one of my clients, we had lunch, I said, do you know who I work for? And he turned to me and he said, no, who? And I knew at that moment it didn't matter where we were, it was a matter of being with a company and a culture that we were happy with. Mm -hmm. Jeff, you mentioned you're, you're expanding, you're feeling the pressure. Are you looking at acquisitions at all, or do you, is your strategy to just sort of expand organically? Based on the partner and based on the importance of the market, we're looking at a number of different strategies. So we've had, we've grown through expansion, we've grown through, or through acquisition, we've grown through more organic growth, where we've put together two or three brokerage teams from different firms that, you know, were looking for a different culture. Um, so we're open. Our capital, I think, speaks to expansion or seed capital for you know a couple different groups or brokerage teams that are getting together. Mm -hmm. So it, again, it also depends on the the depth of the market and the size of the market. So we're looking at some expansion right now that is going to be very exciting for us. That is Canadian based. We're looking at some expansion that is going to be south of the border, potentially in Mexico. Um, and then you know we still have, I think. 10 to 12 large markets in the US that we're looking to expand into. So uh, Miami was actually the really the first success of what we've been on track for maybe for the last six to 12 months for uh, looking at a purely East Coast expansion as well. Mm -hmm. And Me Mexico and Canada, will that be your first overseas expansion? So we have, uh, we have one office in Vancouver currently. Okay. And we have a partnership with a UK firm called uh, Gerald Eve. And they have eight offices in the UK and then 18 partner offices throughout Western Europe and, and a partner in uh, Mumbai, India. Mm -hmm. So, but that would be, that would be kind of the, our North American uh, expansion plan. I want to move on to a subject where you already mentioned that you can't talk about it too much, um, but I still want to address it. Is, um, so Lean Associates is getting into the residential business in New York City. You're traditionally a commercial brokerage. On the flip side, we have Compass, right? A com residential brokerage getting expanding in commercial, um, are we, is that a trend? Are we gonna see more companies trying to do both or does it still make sense for a company to, to just focus on one of the two? So for us, we don't have aspirations to become a crossover company or this resumercial um, group. I think that's market driven. Um, so similar to CB and some of our larger competitors where they are looking for institutional assets that they can sell through different products like property management, asset management, obviously transactional brokerage, leasing and sales is part of it. Um, we responded to a need based on our client base that is developing residential real estate that is, uh, whether it's condominiums or apartments for lease, so we're participating through the life cycle of that asset class in New York. I don't see us um, that, that proliferating throughout our organization. New York's a very unique market for us. We're, Really proud of how large our presence has gotten there, but it's going to be. We will operate a little bit differently in New York because the New York guys tell us how different they are and how important it is to be different in New York. So we'll we will be uh, a little different in New York than we will throughout the rest of our platform. Let's move on to the next subject, which is IPOs. Um, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of that lately, but if we look back at Newmark's IPO, which was happened late last year, there were a couple of news reports about the fact that the IPO was actually pretty disappointing. They sold few shares and they thought they would and they priced not as high as expected. Um, Ralph, do you have a sense of why the IPO was disappointing or why there might not be that investor appetite for commercial real estate stocks that we thought there would be? 
And do you think this discourages, might discourage other brokerages from going the same way? There are only about 4 million commercial properties in the U.S., and that's compared to about 120 to 130 million residential properties in the U.S. So as far as appeal to uh, the, the the mass investor, the mass consumer, which is what we're talking about uh, with an IPO, I, I think maybe there was a little bit too much weight put in how desirable commercial would be at a marketing value uh, you know, to, to, to the general consumer, the general investor. Um, I, there's probably a lot more uh, behind behind the scenes <laughs> that I don't know about, uh, but at least that's, that's one... Um, you know, I think one expectation there that the consumers may not have had uh, with, with commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. it is, is this maybe a sign of a general pessimism about the real estate market, or would that be too far-fetched? I, I think it's a little far-fetched to, to say that now. I mean, I think if the uh, uh, if the stock were to have really, really tanked, we would be having a different uh, uh, conversation right now, but I don't think there's any indications that, that that's going to be the case. Mm -hmm. I think it's responsive to the amount of debt that is on the balance sheets of those new companies. They took on tremendous debt to not just Newmark, but Cushman, and they took on a lot of debt to acquire companies to make sure that they had a full service platform. And, and I think then you go public and the burden of that debt weighs very heavily. Right. In Cushman's case, a private equity company bought the company and then took on a lot of debt to expand it. Right. Um, well, since we're now on the subject of Cushman and Wakefield, uh, Patrick, Cushman and Wakefield went public in the summer. For the longest time, they were one of the big three companies that wasn't public, right? You had JLL, CBRE, public, Cushman and Whitefield, privately owned. Now all three are public. Does that change anything for you at all? Do you have to see, is, are they more of a competitor to you now, or is it, does it not make a difference for you? I don't think it makes a big difference. Um, you know, all these companies are big. They like to bundle their services, which I think is what everybody's trying to do. And you were talking about the residential. None of these firms are in the residential, but, you know, once you get a client, you want to be able to service that client in multiple ways, you know, whether it's on the financing, whether it's purchasing, whether it's leasing, whether it's investments. So they want to get into the, the whole bundling of the project. So do I see it as more of competition? Uh, you know, all these firms are great firms, mm -hmm. you know, and they all have great talent there. I don't see it as, I don't think it's changed the dynamics of the real estate world and the, and the different uh, companies that are out there. But, uh, you know, it gives them a little bit of a larger platform, a little bit more money. Uh, to be increasing those platforms. So I think it's positive for them, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a positive for the market. Is there a difference at all for those who work at these companies being public as opposed to being private? Like, are there different things, whether you work in management or brokerage, are there different things you have to focus on um, when you're a public company as opposed to a private company? Not from my standpoint, no. Yeah. As long as they pay me every uh, couple of weeks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no, like, there's no, like, CEO that tells you like the beginning of earnings season like oh we have to publish our results next week so you better like do some deals now. Well, you know my group is a little bit different because we are exclusive to the J.P. Morgan portfolio and team, so I, we're we're a different animal. Um, but certainly you have that. I mean we've got quotas, we've got budgets, and you know they're looking at that all the time. Um, I think it's like any other company. You know if you're performing, they leave you alone. Yeah. You know if you're not hitting those numbers, they're going to be on you. We've been in a very, very fortunate market here over the last, you know, eight to ten years. And if you're not making money in this market, you're probably not going to be in the business much longer. So, um, you know, maybe when, maybe when the market changes, and hopefully that's not for a while, but uh, maybe you'll start seeing some more of that pressure. But uh, right now, it's, it's pretty strong. Yeah. And, and Elizabeth, there's inevitably going to be rumblings and rumors about when Compass is going to go public. Is that going to be the next big surprise for you, do you think? I think that's already the rumblings that are out there are, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, when it's going to go public. But in, from our perspective, it doesn't make a difference kind of either way. I mean, we hear the rumblings, people talk about it, um, but we're so, you know, insulated in our business uh, that it really, I don't think, will affect us in a negative way. It, it'll probably just be a positive. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, do you sometimes wish you were a public company? Is it Never. Part of you? No? <laughs> no. I think, well, I think uh, from an industry standpoint, Wall Street analysts are really challenged by transactional brokerage revenue because it has the tendency to be to fluctuate greatly. So it's, it's up and it's down, and it's not something you can program for each quarter. So I think so to speak to CB's platform, and they have a tremendous company, and uh, they provide... 10 different services which help them program the income and kind of flatten it and then when brokerage revenues are great and they outperform 
I think you'll see the stock price pop. And when brokerage revenues are lighter, whether it's market forces or just timing, I think the other services they provide will will sub in for that revenue. Um, and I think Wall Street likes how uh, programmatic that other those other service lines present income in. For us, we're transactional brokers. I would not want to report to an investor group or a, a, a conference call every quarter. It would be very, very challenging. Um, we take a much longer view because we don't have that reporting uh, necessity. We, Of course, we have budgets and we have requirements and we have thresholds and goals and objectives, but I think we're looking at those more in one and three and five years. So you mentioned earlier, Jeff, that um, companies like Cushman, Newmark took on some debt to expand pretty aggressively prior to their IPO. Um, they've hired a bunch of top teams in New York City, for example, Cushman and Wakefield's uh, poached Adam Spies and Doug Harmon, who are the, the top investment sales brokers probably in the country. Um, Ralph, can, can you t what's the economic rationale behind this? Why would a company try to do whatever they can to expand right before an IPO? Isn't it a little bit late? Uh, it depends what their what their long-term goals are. I, I mean, when, when, when companies make decisions, um, it's not always about the, the, the short-term return to uh, stockholders. Uh, I mean, stockholders will respond, and that's what causes uh, prices to, to go up and down. But I think there's a lot of... Um, a lot of examples of this in, in the marketplace of companies actually making good, prudent, long-term decisions that uh, stockholders don't necessarily agree with in the, in the short run. So, on the residential residential side, for example, um, uh, you know companies like Zillow, uh, you know, announced that they're going to start basically buying homes from consumers and, and and reselling them. That that was widely unpopular with um, stockholders, and it may turn out to be a long-term bad bet. But it was a, it was a big it was a big important bet. So, you know, the question is how prudent that decision is, is made. I think there's an argument if you're going to take on that debt, it's a long-term investment uh, to grow, uh, even if stockholders don't agree. The question is whether or not that plan is going to be well executed. And, and there's risk in that ex execution. And I think that's why, um, you know, some of, the, some of the stock may have uh, been volatile around the, the, the time of the IPO. Yeah. And for, for the rest of the panel, as these companies have tried to grow prior to the IPOs, has that increased competition for talent in the industry? Do you get offers from... A company trying to go public like once a week nowadays? Our brokers get approached all the time and we've seen quite a bit of trading between the largest companies in in the largest markets whether it's CB, JLL, Cushman Colliers, Newmark, Avis & Young, Leonis. I mean there's been quite a bit of trading um, so you'll see a large team leave Cushman and go to, to Newmark and then you'll see a large team leave Newmark and go to CB, and it seems like it's a little bit of a lazy Susan effect. Um, but I think there's been quite a bit of debt that has been um, accumulated based on the acquisition of brokerage talent. Um, and to your question earlier about why would a company do this before the IPO, if I can take a brokerage team that's doing $20 million in revenue in a large market and I can pay them a signing bonus and tie them up in a contract for five years that's equal to one times their revenue or maybe one and a half or two times, and then I can go to Wall Street in six months and my IPO will pay me six times for that revenue. It's an easy bet. Is there, is there a risk of overpaying for that kind of talent though that you'll end up offering them too much to entice them away? Inherently, there's a risk anytime you buy something, you may overpay for it. But with brokerage talent, I mean, you know, it's, it's very challenging to pay a forward for brokerage talent that especially when we've been involved in a tremendous expanding market with um, with higher values and, and higher fee revenue. So you're basically saying it's a no-brainer to do whatever you can to get the best talent from your competitors. I think you always want to have the best talent. I think you want to try and achieve acquisition of that talent at reasonable numbers. Yeah. What do you think? I was just going to say the interesting thing that I've seen, and I'm not part of that world really, but I think any talented broker is going to be poached, right, all the time in a good market. Um, what I've seen, or the kind of the buzz that I hear, it, which I think is interesting, um, the firms that are looking to acquire, right? So they're pulling these people and they're paying some pretty decent money to acquire them. But it's the existing brokers that are there that are kind of going, well, wait a minute, what about me? You know, you're paying that guy X amount of money to come on over or that gal X amount of money to come on over. What are you gonna do for me to keep me in place? And that's where I, I see kind of a, an interesting dynamic. And all of a sudden that person that's been with whatever firm you may wanna call it, that's been there for 15 or 20 years that has no intention of moving. And then all of a sudden they're kind of going, well, 
you know, gosh, if that person's getting X amount of money, maybe I'm worth that too. And maybe I should throw my hat into the ring. So you kind of have that re revolving door a little bit, which, uh, which I think is interesting to, to kind of watch. Yeah. Elizabeth, before you joined Pacific Union, were you ever approached just out of curiosity by Compass? Or were they at that point not really interested in the commercial space? We knew that they were in the marketplace. And um, when we left our old company, we took you know, quite a few people. And funny enough, at the time, our decision was when we knew that Compass was, because we were being reached out by many companies, um, when we found out that Compass was out in the marketplace looking, our concern was, wow, that's a really big residential firm. And that was a concern of ours. Um, and so we had gone from more of a boutique firm, and we're, we didn't want to do a Keller Williams type feel um, you know, at the time. And we just didn't probably know enough about them. Uh, but they were definitely looking at talent. They hadn't approached us. We were being approached more by like the, the bigger companies. Speaking of Compass, they have a huge valuation. I actually forget what it is. I think it's $2 billion. Uh, WeWork is the most famous example. I believe they're valued, reportedly valued at, at north of $30 billion, which would make them the most valuable real estate services company, uh, if you want to classify them that by a mile. Uh, and then you have companies like CBRE Cushman actually valued a lot less than that. Is there sort of a disconnect between how self-styled tech companies are valued and how everyone else is valued? Like, is WeWork actually the most valuable real estate services company, or do you guys think there's like evaluation inflation for tech companies and then there's everyone else? It's a question for the whole panel. If anyone wants to ask, and answer it. <laughs> it's a very difficult question to see how investors evaluate the a company. I think people put a, a lot of uh, a lot of weight on the future of WeWork. So you're buying growth rather than, you know, a dividend and may, maybe a, a steadier progression with a brokerage firm. But I think it's the future of what becomes with WeWork because we're continue to be in an expanding economy. That economy speaks to more startups. It, it speaks to what WeWork offers, which is really flexible office space and the ability to grow into space without, you know, spending a tremendous amount of capital um, and allowing you to do it in, in within one company or within one property. So I think you're looking at a valuation for WeWork that is looking, you know, three to five years ahead when they've leased, you know, probably double the amount of square footage that they have and they become even more important to institutional landlords and also to, you know, not only technology companies, but media companies and startups in general. Mm -hmm. Companies like WeWork Compass market themselves as tech companies and you can debate as to whether they actually are tech companies. I mean, would you ever consider rebranding Lean Associates like a technology or a community company? And do you think that would change things? We will, we're not a technology company. We're, we're going to buy great technology, and I think we're continuing to add resources to our platform. But we're, we're I mean, the secret about, I think, real estate brokerage firms is that we're really in the information business. And so we, we think we're, you know, historically have been involved in selling and leasing real estate, but we're really in the information dissemination business. So the better we can use technology, whether it's internal technology, external technology, third party information from our brokers across the, across the country or across North America, that's, that's how we'll grow, is through the, the ability to uh, harness more information, to aggregate it, to filter and distill it, and then communicate it to clients and prospects. Big data has always been this buzzword. Recently, there's a couple of companies who've become incredibly valuable, valuable basically, by virtue of controlling a lot of data, Facebook being one example. Is that starting to happen in the real estate business too, that companies are sort of realizing how valuable their data is and are trying to figure out ways to sort of utilize that data? Ralph, is that something that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, 100%. If you look at the traditional role, for example, on the residential side of the real estate agent, um, it really, the real estate agent was the bastion of, of knowledge and, and information, just like Jeff said here. Um, what Zillow, Redfin, Trulia, so on and so forth did is they democratized that data. They gathered, they compiled, and then they gave it directly to the consumer. So the consumer would come into the transaction much more informed, uh, and the broker was uh, less a gatekeeper to that information. I think on the commercial side, certainly uh, companies like CoStar are trying to be the Zillow, Redfin, Trulia of, of the commercial real estate world, but there's a lot more challenges. Data is 
um, a lot more um, deconcentrated. It's in the hands of many, many different brokerages. There really isn't a central MLS system like there is in uh, the residential side. But I think there's still a lot of opportunity for, for growth. At the end of the day, it's about making the client a much better informed to help them make more prudent decisions. On the residential side, I think that's quite far along. I think there's a long way to go on, on the commercial side. The difference is, is that on the commercial side, uh, pretty much everyone compared to the consumer side, uh, the residential side, they're a lot more informed, they're professionals. So it's uh, you know making sure that the data and knowledge and information that you're providing to them is actually uh, a value add for their decision making. And that's a lot more difficult than uh, you know, to value add for someone who really doesn't know anything about buying or selling real estate, which you can make an you know, argument the residential side uh, consumers are a lot less, <laughs> uh, a lot, lot less informed uh, than, uh, or a lot less, uh, they have a lot less expertise than, uh, than, than say, um, investors or, or, or brokers. Yeah, so every, every commercial leasing broker has a CoStar account that they can access. They have a basic understanding of what the market is like. So if you want to find data to, to make them actually do their job better, get a competitive edge, you have to find new types of data. What are some of the data that, that you see is sort of people I, using to try to get yeah, that I, I mean, fundamentally, it's about building a 100% um, census, if you will, of the commercial real estate market. And I, and I think CoStar has, has, has done that. And they're trying to do it in a, in a better way. Certainly, um, Zillow and Trulia have done that. Um, but it's not just data itself. Um, yes, I mean, we have... Uh, brokers that can that can use data, uh, but really it's about the knowledge that comes out of those data, and that's that's the challenge. Um, and right now, it's you know on, on, the, on the knowledge production side, it's a race between um, you know let's say um, companies that have uh, economists that can analyze these data, or also uh, machines. Increasingly, it's going to be machines that can analyze data at high frequency intervals and produce knowledge and information about uh, the market, whether it's macro or micro, to help. Uh, brokers and investors make much more prudent decisions, and uh, you know I don't have an answer as to who's who's going to win out, but um, the machines are certainly uh, charging ahead. Yeah, so I was talking to a broker in New York City a couple of months ago um, about the type of data that they use, and he told me that one of the new data points that they look at is taxi ridership data. So if they want to figure out which neighborhood is the next boomtown where you want to invest, you look at taxi ridership and figure out oh this is a neighborhood where people take a lot of taxis at 11 p.m so probably there's a lot of nightlife so probably it's a really hip neighborhood so maybe i want to invest there because it's going to get more valuable which i found really interesting because it's an example of the type of data that you don't really think of when you think of commercial real estate data right we think you know average rents per square foot that kind of thing um patrick jeff is there any sort of new type of data that you guys now look at in your business that maybe you didn't five or ten years ago i don't really think so candidly uh you know data is king right so the more information you have the better uh the more knowledge that you can share to your clients i think i still think there's a, a lot of in our business a lot of the human uh factor right and it's you know who does the client feel comfortable working with um so many people have the same data Right, it's it's the way you market it, it's the way you present it, um, and I think that human factor has a lot lot to do with it. So, um, you know, yes, there are a lot of new matrix that we're all working with, and and we can present to the clients. But at the end of the day, I mean, I hate to say it, it still kind of comes down to, hey, what's the price per square foot? What are the concessions? You know, how long is the term? You know, what's the load factor? You know, I mean, those type of deals. But. Um, uh, I think the human component is still a very strong factor there. Mm -hmm. So I think that, like, like you, you talked about with the property level data, it seems to be very homogenous now. So if every broker has a CoStar account and they can all see the same data, what's the next level? Which I think is your question. So we're looking at data that includes um, the, the proliferation of a skilled workforce. One of the hardest things, one of the most difficult tasks for a client relocating is where can they go where they can find a skilled workforce that you know, is in a market where there are people looking for jobs. I mean, we have a 4% unemployment now. And depending on where you go, there just aren't people looking for jobs. And so that's very challenging. Um, I think the next level of data is more predictive analysis. So, you know, we can all report on property level data. And I think it does have a lot to do with the personal nature of it and what Elizabeth said, where her client trusts her and doesn't care what her logo is on her card. But what's the next level? What do, what do migration patterns look like? What does... What does transit do? What does government uh, investment do? I mean, if you take a look at where we've had tremendous growth just in California, so you take a look at transit lines, you take a look at the port of, of Long Beach and Los Angeles, 
I mean, those have been real drivers. You see where certain cities have incentivized uh, film production. I mean, those have been real catalysts and drivers. So I think it's the, an understanding of kind of what the governmental investment is, um, what that transit looks like, and where there are employees. I think those are the places that, those, that's the kind of data that we're looking at now. Mm -hmm. So the rise of data in the brokerage industry is maybe part of a bigger trend, which is the rise of technology. Um, Elizabeth, you're, you're joining a company that always um, you know, puts a lot of value into its technology. Do you think the technology that you're going to get with Compass is going to be a game changer for you, or do you think it's just more like something that's nice on the side, but not really crucial to how you work? I think it's going to be a wait and see, because I fully don't understand the technology. I'm, I'm not really sure what we're, we're getting in terms of technology. And I think there are a lot of complex data points in our business, which is why the Zillows of the residential have taken off there. But when it comes to our business, there's so much more to know. And so, and it's the zoning, it's the property down the street that's abandoned, but you know what's happening two years down the road. And those are data points that I think are irreplaceable when it comes to our business. So I'm curious to see the technology and we'll work with it to roll out, but I think it's just gonna complement our business as opposed to take over our business. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a few minutes left. If anyone has questions in the audience, we'd be happy to take them. Yeah, it's, an, it's interesting because when I first was making the decision, we're talking to all these companies and they're saying what they're going to offer. And I said, you know, the marble actually kind of scares me off. I said, I don't need the marble. I, we can, I go, we can work out of our garage and, um, and be just fine. You know, if we were starting in this business, we would maybe need the marble to stand behind us. So one of the biggest things that was important to me that was just a very simple thing was the layout of our office. And I wanted it to be cohesive because we work, I, I work as a team and I like having team members and I like everyone interacting. And, you know, we have a culture where in our office, we're very close. We have fun together. You know, I sometimes joke like we work out together, we go out together, we work together. You know, where we do have kind of that, um, I joke, we're kind of like a family. And so uh, I didn't want to go into a number one, like a sterile office. I wanted that energy in the office. And then I also didn't want to go into an office that I felt was so highly competitive. Um, I, I like having collaboration between people. I like being able to share a deal with someone and know that you know, they're not going to turn around and call the owner. And so that, those were things that were important to us. So it was um, you know, a culture of fun and work. And it, the energy that the office provided was very important. I'll have another one. Um, so I sort of saved this for the end because I don't know, maybe it's a difficult question um, or impossible to answer. But um, we've talked about how important it is for companies to use their data to build out their technology. All that is expensive, right? It costs money to build out a technology team. It costs money to build out a data analysis team. And inevitably, that's easier for big companies than it is for small companies. But right? if you're a CBRE, you can hire five people to collect data, and it's no big deal. If you're a five-person company, hiring five more people is a huge deal. So if data and technology are actually becoming more important for the brokerage business, does that inevitably skew the playing fields, tilt the playing field in favor of the big companies? Is it just going to be harder and harder for small companies to compete with the big companies? I think it actually will be. And part of the reason that I think that is I think when you, you know, we have the motto in our office, control the inventory and you control the market because you know what's going on. So if a company has such, so much control over a market, then they have all the information that everyone needs. So I think as people get bigger, if they do, you know, I know on leasing, if, if people need lease rates, well, if you're doing all the leases, then you're more valuable in the marketplace. And so that data, if you are bigger, you're able to kind of put all that data together. It does make you very valuable. I think on the expense side for most firms, rent used to be the high watermark. That used to be your most expensive component of your company. I think now technology and data is. And uh, so you talk about the large companies versus the smaller companies. I think the, obviously the large companies have that advantage because it's difficult to incur those type of startup costs for, for, the, smarter, for, for the smaller firms. So. Conventional wisdom says absolutely yes. Um, bigger firms have more capital, they have more resources, but the way we've seen the rollout of technology and its importance is really about adoption. It's not solely about the quantity of it or the quality of it, but it's about 
How does it really service agents, local management, corporate leadership? And so I think that while we've seen a number of our competitors make, you know, seven, 10, $15 million errors in developing CRMs and technology-based systems that are supposed to help their brokerage that don't get adopted and they get path tossed to the wayside. I think we're a little more proactive we're working in partnership with technology firms that are providing what ultimately will be a full suite of services for our brokers. Everything from, you know, something that takes the property from the prospect stage all the way through the closed deal and then evaluates and analyzes that deal not only within its product discipline but within that team um, talks about you know how much how long did it take to get to market how long was it on the market you know who the buyers were and we're trying to gather as much data as possible that we can use it I think in a really effective efficient way but also in a way that we're adopting technology that is going to be across the platform and not have spotty adoption so we're not able to be seamless throughout our company yeah and Ralph, I stole your mic, but I don't want to silence you. you I'll, I'll speak. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think um, uh, at, at first start, yes, there, there's high fixed costs associated with developing um, analytics teams and, and data management and, and CRM platforms. There's no, there's no doubt uh, that big companies have that advantage, right? They have the capital to be able to make those investments. Um, however, I think like we've seen in other sort of industries and markets and adoption of technology, there is a market for third parties to come in and provide those at scale to smaller brokerages so that brokerages don't have to develop these in-house. Uh, so I'm confident that even, even now, it may be difficult for small companies to make those investments that there will be third parties that will eventually come in and be able to um, uh, provide uh, provide those services. I mean, if you look at uh, what it took to develop software 20, 30, 40 years ago, you had to have, uh, you know, really, really uh, expensive teams uh, of software engineers to develop software. Now, uh, you know, a 14-year-old, 15-year-old kid can develop software in an app at home. And you know, I think we'll see that similar trend over, over time when it comes to providing uh, the, the technology and data services that, that, that small brokerages need. All right, so it's not all bad news for small firms. It's a good point to close on. Thanks so much for having us. Please give a round of applause to the panelists.